Hope everybody's feeling good this morning. High energy? Yes? All right, stand up first. Just get the blood flowing. Come on, just come on. Stand up. Shake your arms a little bit. Stretch just a little bit. We're going to dive into a fast-paced present series of presentations that we use at the SRI conference to introduce generally a couple of dozen money managers. Go ahead and sit down. <laughs> um, we call these popcorn presentations. Some of the organizers, some of the people involved in organizing this event had experienced that and thought it would be a cool thing to do here. So we'll see how it goes. At the end, you can tell us whether you liked it or not. Uh, I am Steve Sheath. Thank you for the introduction, George. Appreciate it very much. Those of you that were with us on Wednesday night uh, saw me on the main stage of the Heroes event. Really appreciate it that you were there. How many were there? OK, more importantly, how many were not there? <laughs> Next year, we want you there. OK, on behalf of the Alliance, thank you very much. Um, First Affirmative is my company. We're based in Colorado. Uh, we manage money for socially conscious investors. Um, we work with small clients as little as $50,000. And of course, there's no limit on the upside. And we customize portfolios to the extent we can for everybody. I mentioned the other night that we now have 200, as of Tuesday, we have 294 client accounts that have gone fossil fuel free. And this is not because we've gone out to them and said, do you want to do this? This is them coming to us and saying, do this. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do this morning is introduce you to the solutions side of the equation. Um, I, Brent, Brent from 350 here today? I don't see him. I challenged him a little bit yesterday because, you know, Bill McKibben and 350.org has done just a fabulous job of raising awareness around this issue, um, as we've all discussed at length the last couple of days. Um, but the student groups tend to not really understand or have a way to present the solution side of the equation. In other words, the divestment, in my mind, the divestment decision is actually pretty easy. But it's coupled with the reinvestment decision. And so unless we can present opportunities and strategies and you know, help people understand the, you know, the risk or the mitigation of risk and the fiduciary duty issues around that, you know, it's, it's really hard for some of these boards of directors to make this divestment decision. So today, and we only have a few examples, uh, so please understand that this is just a smattering of the kinds of investment opportunities, the kinds of solutions, the kinds of tools, the kinds of climate um, reduction investment strategies, uh, the kinds of resources that are available to you. We're going to do this quickly, four minutes apiece. Uh, Charles Sandmill, I believe, is running late. So even though he's first on the list, I'm going to push him down a little bit. Uh, Liz Michaels, I need you to come up here first. Liz is the uh, chief of staff and director of ESG and SRI at Aperio. Aperio's based in the Bay Area in that lovely spot across the Bay. You can tell us about that and make everybody jealous, especially on this rainy day. So Liz, uh, you're going to model this for us, uh, even though I know you've not done this before. Um, certainly you can use that mic and that podium, or you can use this one if you prefer to move around like I do. Okay. Um, I will be, four minutes, I, I will have my, uh, my iPhone stopwatch running. Okay. Four minutes. And wow. at the four minute mark, you can expect me to stand up, and if you keep going, I will do this, and then I will walk over here, and I might even do this <laughs> to get you to stop. Why don't you stand up at 3.30? <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll Take it away, Liz. And then I'll, I'll be there. Hi, thank you very much for, for your time. Many of you may be familiar with a study that we have done. Um, we're actually on our second version of it on basically what is the impact of divesting um, uh, from fossil fuels. And the, the bottom line answer, and this is the question that comes up time and time again, is what is the give up? If I divest my strategy from my public equities, and that's all I'm speaking of right now, if I divest, how much is it going to cost me? Am I going to be able to pay for my scholarships, build a new building? And we did a, a very comprehensive study. We looked at what happens if you take the entire oil, gas, and consumable fuel sector out of a indexed portfolio, both domestically and globally? And the answer is, it is de minimis. Okay, We re-optimize the portfolio, um, and you can control any incremental risk. Okay, So if somebody says to you, it can't be done and it's going to cost too much, 
our study is posted. It's posted on the Responsible Endowments Coalition. It's posted on 350. I think it's posted on the primer here, and it's on our website. It includes a back test. That's the other thing that comes up. What happens, you know, that's fine today, but what happened 20 years ago? And we have run those numbers, too. Please avail yourselves of the numbers. Um, to the students, if you don't understand what the numbers mean, call me. I'll explain them, okay? They are intended to be accessible to everybody. So what does that mean in terms of the solution that we offer to folks? Um, we manage about $12 billion in total. Two billion of them are in SRI and ESG strategies. Those are across um, several thousand separately managed accounts, which for those of you dealing with the commingled trust issue, it is an alternative to that. We customize around value sets. This is what our menu looks like. So at a million dollars, we can customize on dozens of variables that reflect your particular institution's needs, whether that is fossil fuel divestment, just coal, fossil fuel divestment, the entire energy sector, whether that also includes Mormon values or Catholic values or Catholic liberal values or sustainable agriculture or women's issues, whatever the combination is that reflects your value set, those are the kinds of portfolios we construct. And we always do them to minimize the risk associated with constraining the portfolio um, around a particular value set. Um, so that, that, in short, is what we do. We are um, index passive and quantitative managers. We charge indexing type fees. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. We do that. Yeah. Two minutes and 20 seconds. Awesome. We're way ahead of, t ahead of schedule here this morning already. One of the things I'm finding, especially from the naysayers, is that they think that if you're getting out of fossil fuels, you're getting out of the energy sector. And I think there needs to be a very clear distinction between getting out of fossil fuels and participating in another aspect of the energy sector. <laughs> That's all. managers here who do it in different ways. Um, with our setup, what we'll do is we will remove whatever the offensive companies, sub-industries, industries are, or the entire sector. But you can also tilt back in towards things like renewables. The reality, though, is those companies tend to be a little bit smaller, and they are often the, the ones that are large enough to be liquid in, in our space are often not pure plays. They are utilities that are in both spaces. Um, so, you know, Korean can speak to more of it. They look more closely at it. We're quantitative managers, um, but there are ways of getting in, and I'm happy to share that analysis. You, I think you did. Thank you very much. Between you and John, well done. Nice teamwork. Charles, thanks for coming in. Did you have your cup of coffee yet this morning? Come on up and do your best, man. <laughs> Charles Sandmill, uh, Portfolio Manager, Shelton Capital Management. Good morning, anybody, everybody. Steve, you just cut five seconds off my speech. Thank you. The other half of my resume is that I have served as the investment on the investment committee of a faith-based liberal values charity for 20 years. So I know this situation from both sides. And I have hired managers based on, among other things, their SRI credentials and their ability to customize to our needs. What I want to talk to you about is on the professional side to the use of bonds first as tool in the investment policy in general and second as a diversifying tactic, an incremental diversifying tactic. Some of you will find this 101, but bonds and stocks serve very, very different purposes in an endowment. Think of hammers and saws. You need both of them to build a house but you don't want to use one for the purpose that the other is there for. Stocks are there to get you some growth, to eventually get you some dividends, and to produce a great deal of upside. They're somewhat more valuable than bonds, which, of course, for that trade-off, make a local re lower return on a historic basis. So using the two of them do diligently gives you the opportunity of participating in both uh, 
both uh, growth and income tangents, and using them together means that they dampen each other and stabilize your portfolio. For the bond sector in an endowment that is looking to become greener, the issue is not so much throw out A and bring in B, but what we're doing and what we have the opportunity to do since bonds mature every few months is to replace old bonds with new ones, and this is what your portfolio manager is paid to do. You have the ability within both your investment policy and in your conversations to ask, what can you do to add a green uh, flavor or a green imp impetus to our bond portfolio? And the answer is there is a great deal. The green bond phenomenon has taken off and the graph of green bonds outstanding today kind of looks like a hockey stick. So you have slow growth from 2008 to 2012, and then boom, there's 60 billion outstanding. This is in a market that is largely AAA, largely in US dollars. It's denominated by the large supranationals like the World Bank, and they are highly credit worthy. They trade probably 25 or so basis points behind US treasuries, which are, I think are of like quality. Besides the World Bank, you have corporate issues from companies like Toyota Finance, Bank of America, uh, First Solar, and so forth. And you have municipalities and other subnational agencies. The municipality bonds so far are mostly tax exempt and probably don't belong in an endowment, but there are a few taxable munis that will do this. Um, I think I am, you are better served if I take your questions. Thank you very much for listening. Sir. There are two flavors of bonds that I have seen from solar cities. The first one was an asset back piece, which was triple B, and it came before I had a chance to see it. The second one is a very, very different animal. It's not a pure green play, and I'd rather discuss this off stage if you don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Questions only work if people stop really early in this four minute time slot, okay? Uh, Katrina, Karina, well, I don't know why I put it, try to put a T in there. Karina Funk, uh, co-portfolio manager of the Brown Advisory Large Cap Sustainable Growth Strategy. Boy, that's a mouthful. You want to do this or that? Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do this. I'll turn it back around. <laughs> Very good. I don't want the hug. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> later, later, when we're done, when we're done. <laughs> All right, well, good morning. Um, it's actually been really good for me to hear in the past day and a half that I think most of us have reasonable expectations for expecting an attractive financial return, as well as achieving a larger educational and public purpose. And we've heard a lot in the past day and a half about indexing and about, and there's abundance of data that shows that if you do things like divest from fossil fuels, you're not likely to do worse than the broad market over time. And I'm excited to talk to, to share with you I think a complementary approach to uh, impact investing, and that is one that arrives at it from the ambition of being unapologetically about performance first, but operating at the intersection with sustainability over the long term. And I think that at that intersection is where we find some of the most compelling investment possibilities over the next decades. And the reason why I'm confident about finding these opportunities is that in our economy, across the entire economy, we have a lot of environmental challenges. And uh, you know, Tom Van Dyke, if you heard him yesterday, did a great job explaining how these risks don't only exist in your energy or utility holdings. I mean, just take an orthogonal sector like healthcare. There isn't a single healthcare CEO that isn't concerned about sustainability, even if he or she can't spell that word. She's worried about uh, energy use in hospitals. She's worried about complex waste that needs to be disposed of properly. Um, and worried about where you're gonna get all that clean water to sanitize your equipment and clean the hospital beds, et cetera. 
uh, each of those risks has a corollary opportunity. And you can build a portfolio that addresses those needs in a very compelling way. Things like saving money, saving energy, conserving water, investing in your supply chain for resilience against commodity price volatility or against weather events. These are compelling value propositions that never go out of style, no matter what the price on carbon is, no matter what our regulatory environment is, and frankly, no matter where we are in a macroeconomic cycle. I run a large cap sustainable growth portfolio for Brown Advisory that invests in these positive solutions, and we throw down a real gauntlet for our candidate companies. They have to be fundamentally strong, and there's a lot that goes into finding great companies in good to great industries. They have to have positive environmental drivers that demonstrably benefit financial performance. By doing the hard work to tie environmental drivers to shareholder value, that keeps us focused on decisions that are relevant to investments, and frankly, it helps us not drown in a lot of, in the legions of environmental data that's unrelated to a company's fundamentals and competitive advantages. By finding these types of companies, you're finding management teams that are understand their environmental risks, are investing in the opportunities in their own economic self-interest, and those are the management teams that are building companies uh, that we want to be around for the next 10, 20 plus years. This portfolio happens to be fossil free according to many definitions, but it's not because we're trying to screen out the bad guys, it's because we find more compelling solutions elsewhere. So I just gave you a brief overview of one investment philosophy, the large cap sustainable growth strategy. I have to acknowledge that Mission alignment means different things to different organizations. At Brown Advisory, we run over $50 billion, about half of that in long-only strategies such as mine and a variety of asset classes, and the other half in balanced portfolios, where we really start with an understanding of what that intersection means for clients. Performance, we can address and agree on, uh, depending on goals. As far as mission alignment, what legacy do you want to leave? Are you worried about contradicting your organization's mission uh, from uh, in your investment portfolio. These are fair questions for any organization, whether they come to us for a mission aligned mandate or not. And by holding those investment opportunities to that intersection and to the same high standards of performance, operational and financial due diligence, we can start to build portfolios that really address both of those needs of performance and mission alignment and, and not either or. Thank you. Awesome. Well done. Thank you very much. So we've heard from a, an index tracking quantitative manager. We've heard from a fixed income manager. We've heard from a, um, an alpha seeking equity manager. Um, another alpha seeking equity manager actually has alpha in the name. Callie, where are you? There, Callie Wyant, uh, director of, de of uh, business development for Green Alpha Advisors based in Boulder, Colorado. Do you like the mic or the podium? All right. So it's great to be here. My name is Callie Wyant, and I'm Director of Business Development at Green Alpha Advisors. I'm Director of Business Development at Green Alpha Advisors. Our firm was founded in 2007 based on the macroeconomic idea that the world is getting warmer, more populous, and resource constrained. And taking that macro view, what we've done at Green Alpha is think about what would an economy look like in 20 to 50 years that's completely sustainable and indefinitely sustainable. And how do we get there? Now, we only invest in public equities. And what we really do, we've heard a lot about negative screening these past few days. We don't start with a basket of stocks. What we do is we start with a science. And we look, we talk with climate experts, battery experts, and we're really looking at all sectors of the economy. And from that, what we do is we go down and we find sustainability solutions. And we've heard, and those can be across all sectors. So it could be efficiency gains, new technologies, innovations, looking at waste to value. Now we look for companies globally, so they have to be traded in the US, but we will look for companies all over the um, world. We also look at companies of all sizes. So we, might, may, we may wind up with micro cap stocks and mega cap stocks. Um, we have a six year track record in our next economy um, index. And we also are the sub advisor on a publicly traded mutual fund, 
which is called the Shelton Green Alpha Fund, and that has a low minimum. So we're trying to um, really address what, what the world looks like in the future and how we get there. And it's just, it's a very simple thesis. It resonated with me personally, and I think it's a great way to, uh, to add a, a forward-looking thesis into your portfolio. So, thank you. Kelly, you have time for a question or two if you want. Okay, I'll take a question. <laughs> no. All right. Very good. N E X T X, next economy. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. I, I hope I'm not intimidating you, speakers. Um, well, actually, I hope I'm intimidating you a little bit to, to stay on time. But I don't want you to be fearful of you know using your four minutes. All right. Anyway, on to Chris Warren, Chief Executive Officer of Clean Energy Advisors. Uh, Chris, I believe that that your you know what you do is is on the private side of the ledger. I mean, so far we've heard from public market. Um, professionals, and you're on the private side. Okay. This, this one or the post? No, I'm going to take this one last. I'm going to have to say it. <laughs> okay. Walking around and, and I really don't care for the hug either, but, uh, <laughs> but it's okay. I'm sorry. I'm not, I, I, I'm not, you know, it's, it, you know. Anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, my, my passion for it, don't start the clock yet. My passion for impact investing um, uh, started really in the early 80s, um, long before ESG or impact investing or really any of, any of the terms we use today were being discussed. And actually, long before I knew what a stock or a bond was, to be honest with you. I was 13 years old. My father took me on a camping trip to West Virginia. And we started out on Saturday morning. We went on this very ambitious hike for a 13-year-old. And we ended up, you know, walking through the wilderness, essentially trying to climb this huge mountain. And got to the top of that mountain, and I can actually remember, as vivid as I can remember anything in my life, how beautiful it was, how pristine it was. I was probably complaining because I was 13 and I was really tired. But I looked at my left, and I couldn't believe what I saw. The entire top of a mountain was being systematically dismantled in amongst this pristine wilderness. My dad went on to explain, hey, you know, it's a safer way, it's a more efficient way to provide coal for power plants. And he talked for 10 or 15 more minutes about it. I can remember to this day just sitting there and thinking, you know, there's got to be a better way. So flash forward to 2006, and I had a liquidity event that allowed me the opportunity to kind of put into action the passion that I have for the environment that was born on that mountaintop in West Virginia. You know, I identified a small sector of the solar industry that was kind of underserved, and my team and I built a company based on providing funding for small-scale solar utility projects. And while most of what we've done has been in structured financing, the economics of solar projects has changed substantially in the past few years, and it's really opening the door up to a larger group of investors. I'll give you an example. Two and a half years ago, we did a structured financing deal for a five megawatt project just north of Charlotte, North Carolina. The total capex for that project was $20 million. Today, in the same area, we're acquiring five megawatt projects for $8 million. A significant difference. And having spent most of my earlier career in retail financial services, you know, the more projects that we funded, the more apparent to me it became that the underlying aspects and characteristics of solar projects would resonate very well with conservative and income-oriented investors. In particular, there are three compelling characteristics of solar on the investment side. Predictable income, preservation of capital, and positive impact. The underlying financials of solar projects are based on steady, predictable cash flows driven by long-term contracts to, produce all, to purchase all the power between the asset owner and the utility company. In fact, we call uh, solar investments a series of knowns. It's a known capex, it's known energy production, it's a known fuel cost, which can't be free, right? Although it's a little difficult today. And it's a known revenue, 
from the sale of the electricity. It's not flashy, it's not high tech, it's simple, predictable income. And we do structured investments for both taxable and non-taxable entities. And while the way that we use the renewable energy tax attributes differs between the two, in both structures, we're able to provide a scheduled return of principal payment in addition to quarterly distributions that are at above market rates. Now, I don't have to go and try to sell this room on the positive impacts of clean energy. I think we all pretty much get that. Uh, what I will say, though, that with solar, it's very, um, uh, you, you're scaring me. It's, <laughs> he's, he's coming. It, it, it's very measurable and it's real. So predictable income, preservation, preservation of capital, and positive impact. That's what we focus on in clean energy. And I'm going to leave you this, and you can come give me a hug. It's okay. <laughs> you don't have to stretch yourself out on the yield curve. I promise. I love you, man. We'd love to talk to you more about what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sorry, I went over time. Hey, I've been known to use a cowbell, but I didn't bring the cowbell. I'm sorry, Barbara, I forgot the cowbell. So I thought, you know, the personal, more intimate approach would be better. Uh, people are not liking it, though. I think I'm going to go back to the cowbell. Um, some of you may have noticed that we skipped over Bob Helmuth. Bob called me the, early this morning and said that his, leak, his roof was leaking. Uh, it was raining pretty hard last night, and so he couldn't make it today. So we're going to continue to move through our, uh, our list. Katie Hoffman, managing partner. Uh, co-founder and managing partner of the Resilience Collaborative. Are you here, Katie? Where are you? Come on up. Katie's got a great little resume in the book. I hope you all have a chance to read. Take a, take a minute to read it. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Katie Hoffman, and as, as was mentioned, I'm the co-founder of uh, Resilience Collaborative. I also am a co-founder of Fossil Free UC, which was the uh, student campaign to transition the University of California's $91 billion portfolio folio out of the top fossil fuel companies and into climate solutions. Now, I've been involved in that campaign since 2011, when it was very small, and most of us were on this side of the spectrum. Uh, and now, I've, I've seen it through to a process where we have not actually achieved full divestment, but we have achieved a policy um, for full ESG integration into that $91 billion portfolio uh, and a commitment across asset classes, that is, and um, a, a commitment to $1 billion of investment in climate solutions over five years. Now, what, what has happened there, um, which is interesting, coming from both the student perspective and now working uh, as a consultant to uh, different entities within the University of California is um, the investment office is really trying to figure out how to approach this issue um, with due diligence. And I really appreciate what they have done. Uh, we are working to get more student engagement, which I, I would recommend that everyone in this room try their best to engage as many young people as you possibly can in the decisions that you make that will affect our future. That being said, um, I want to go into a little bit of what they've done, which I do think is um, wonderful. So with this one billion, they have entered, uh, the investment office of the entire UC has entered into a, uh, a coalition with the White House Clean Energy Investment Initiative, uh, and this is a coalition uh, with the Hewlett and Schmidt Foundations, as well as Wells Fargo, to catalyze $2 billion of investment, private sector investment, uh, in climate solutions, namely in uh, prominent and promising uh, carbon reducing technologies. Now, they've also j joined the UNPRI and Ceres, and they're um, investigating how to decarbonize the portfolio and really trying to get as much information as they possibly can before they deploy different elements of that $1 billion uh, across the different asset classes, mostly right now looking at focusing in private equity. Um, now, at the, at the system-wide level, uh, which, you know, California being the seventh largest economy in the world, it, that's, that's kind of up here. I work now more at the community-based level, uh, particularly at the different campuses, which, you know, sometimes acts as if their own little nation states within a much larger system competing against each other, which is uh, really, really interesting. That being said, I wanted to focus a little bit about what's happening at the campus and community level um, that really, I think, is promising and, and potentially um, an idea for folks in here with endowments or, or at institutions. 
Um, and this is the, the, the concept of a, a revolving fund or a green revolving fund, which um, anyone in here uh, familiar with the Sustainable Endowments Institute and the Green Billion Challenge? Maybe, yay, woohoo. So really, really wonderful idea. And the idea is to set up revolving loan funds on campuses um, to increase efficiency and then generate cost savings that will revolve back into the fund to continue to do that. You can see that there might be some barriers to that given the proximity of a campus. However, um, more than 78 campuses in Canada and the United States have these and they have proven robust returns kind of across the spectrum, anywhere between 25 and 50% over the last seven years that these have kind of been established. Um, in California, California Institute of Technology is one of um, the best models that we have to really illustrate the, the metrics behind this. So I, I would say go look into that. Um, we just actually launched one at UCLA. It's the largest in the country, $15 million. Um, and the really interesting thing about this fund is that it was designed with state policy in mind on how to augment policies that were trying to address carbon efficiency and other forms of climate solutions within communities outside of the kind of ivory tower of the institution. Um, and, and I really appreciate what UCLA has done here because the research they did looked into Proposition 39, which is uh, using sales tax essentially to put into a fund that will create efficiency projects within the community. Uh, and when they designed the fund and they launched it in 2014, uh, they, they wanted to design it in such a way that it could grow with those, those types of investments happening in the community. So I bring this to, to the floor in this short amount of time because this model has tremendous growth potential. I think both within institutions uh, to start, but then also outside of institutions to, to, to create a sort of community opportunity, if you will. Um, and particularly when institutions and, and investors of institutions look into and, cons and consider the state policies and opportunities to expand funds over time to generate larger cost savings. Um, and just, just to close, in the last few years in California, I'm really excited about this policy because it gets to the kind of justice element, which I feel we often need to uh, really push in this, in this conversation. Um, we just passed a, a state policy. I mean, we have AB 32, which is our large comprehensive climate legislation, and within that is a cap and trade policy. Um, and the, a group of environmental justice organizers and, and um, led by this wonderful organization called the Green Lining Institute, ensured that 25% of cap and trade money generated would go back into low income communities and some of the communities most impacted by climate change in California. Now, what we're trying to do and Resilience Collaborative is really looking at, and we've been talking to Green Lining Institute, is how do we take these models that are on campuses generating robust returns um, and actually work with policies that are addressing questions of equity uh, in community. And <laughs> I'm getting the thing, I'm almost done. Um, and uh, that, yeah, that's pretty much it. So making sure, <laughs> yeah, yep. I'm trying to keep it li lively and light. Phil Kirschman, we're skipping Andy Bihar. Andy's going to uh, be our cleanup hitter. Where'd he go? He's not, is he here? Oh, okay. Phil, you going to do this? Yes, I'll do this. Right. Thank you. Um, my preference, by the way, at the end is not to be hugged, but to be played off with loud orchestral music, like it's the end of an Oscars <laughs> speech. I'll have to find that so, on the okay. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck. Uh, well, thank you uh, for the opportunity to address you. My name is Phil Kirschman. I am Chief Investment Officer at Cornerstone Capital Investment Management. We are a consulting firm organized around the idea of delivering sustainability-focused investment solutions across the entire client experience. So for us, that includes a, a deep planning kind of conversation with clients, uh, followed by strategic asset allocation modeling, investment policy statement work, uh, risk modeling, uh, vetting manager solutions across the asset class spectrum, uh, recommending custom uh, combinations of those managers for clients, and uh, implementation support and uh, portfolio reporting. And the reason I sort of mention all those things is because that is the consultant role. And you know, to me, the divest, invest question is very particular to each client, and it should be treated that way. Uh, the divestment decision may be slightly binary. You either do or don't, but the reinvest question is, is very multifaceted, and it has to do, I think, very particularly with each client and why they have chosen to divest. It could be for the moral uh, uh, aspects that Jana mentioned. It's very interesting that you know, there, there's a lot of passion on, on the moral uh, aspects of, and good reasons for that, but there's also very compelling financial arguments for divesting as well. So I think it comes down to that. You have to understand why are you divesting, and that plays very much into why you would reinvest and how you would reinvest. And to me, the interesting 
uh, set of uh, solutions that were presented here are a smattering of the possibilities. Uh, there is a wide landscape of reinvestment opportunity and any consultant who tells you there's a shortage of product, you can't do this, uh, is, an, is a consultant who hasn't done their homework on the availability of products in the space and it's really up to them as your consultant to bring you solutions, not to tell you there aren't any. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I think, you know, I, I think it's really important that uh, consultants recognize where clients are on this uh, spectrum here. It's, it's, you know, wherever you are as an asset owner on this spectrum here, I think it's important that the consultant meet you where you are and help you move to the right at the pace that you can and with the right solutions that are appropriate to you. Uh, there are public securities, private securities, passively managed, actively managed, broadly diversified, concentrated, thematic. There are lots of different ways to approach it. You just need a consultant, I would say, who is gonna be an honest and competent partner with you to meet you where you are and help you find the uh, specific solutions that are most appropriate for you as you go. So that's what we try to be. And uh, I, I promise not, I, I was going to not comment on this carpet and how it looks like a gigantic crime scene of a squid <laughs> that was somehow <laughs> met its demise in a very untimely fashion. But so with that, I'll give up my time. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. You know, I had exactly the same thought about this carpet. I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but it's kind of bizarre, kind of creepy. Um, and I apologize to Stephen Schofield because I skipped you, um, but I'm going to call you up now. Stephen Schofield, director of the South Pole Group. Uh, tell us what's going on with South Pole. Now, it's not the South Pole, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the hug right now. Take your photo up. Great, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, hey, it's been great speaking with so many of you over the last couple of days. Um, and thanks, George and Tony, for putting on such a great event. This is a great gathering. Um, and it feels like collectively we might have explored virtually every dimension of the fossil fuel. Uh, divestment topic as well as the reinvestment opportunities that are associated with the transition to a low carbon economy. It might be fair to suggest that one of the common threads that runs throughout these discussions is that of impact. And um, our firm is wholly dedicated to the measurement and reduction of climate impact. And in this regard, we measure and document our own company impact. So I thought I'd begin with, as I say on that show on NPR, Let's do our numbers. Um, <coughs> ten, uh, 10 years of existence, our company's headquartered in, in Zurich, Switzerland. 128 is the number of carbon emissions reductions projects that South Pole Carbon develops, finances, and manages throughout the world. They're concentrated in developing, emerging, and frontier markets, including China, and also including the project that has provided the carbon neutrality for our gathering from the banquet up until this moment uh, right now. Uh, 1,000 is the number of companies, governments, and agencies that South Pole Carbon has uh, engaged with directly to reduce uh, their carbon footprint. 55 million cubic metric tons is the, uh, the amount of carbon that our company has reduced through our operations and commitments. 20,000 is the number of jobs that have been created over a 10-year period uh, in terms of, the, uh, as, as it corresponds to our investments and operation of these projects around the world. And $200 billion is the amount of assets that our company has screened to evaluate their climate impact, which brings us to uh, our participation in our gathering today. South Pole Carbon entered the, car the capital markets approximately five years ago. Uh, principally through a grant from the Swiss government foundation, My Climate, which enabled the company to work directly with the Swiss Institute of Technology to build out the largest greenhouse gas emissions database for the total universe of publicly traded companies in the world. For those of you that have access to a Bloomberg terminal, you can find a portfolio carbon screening tool that our company owns and, excuse me, runs and operates. It's under the Carbon app. Um, if you'd like to upload a portfolio, um, as an asset owner or an asset manager and benchmark your carbon footprint of greenhouse gas scope one and two emissions vis-a-vis -vis another index, we invite you to do so. Um, and then lastly, I'll leave you with a, a bit of a case study uh, that I have in my hand here. And so a couple months ago, actually three or four months ago, we approached Harvard Management Company, the entity that manages Harvard's endowment. And 
We were quite keen to do a carbon screening of their assets under management, $36 billion. Uh, unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in engaging them. Our cars, calls were uh, unre unresponded to and a meeting was not attained. Uh, subsequently, we were approached by uh, 350.org and the student leadership at Divest Harvard. I think Chloe might still be in the room. Uh, perhaps Brett, both of them have been here today. And they came to our company with a portion of the Harvard endowment, um, not a large portion, it was only 3%, a little north of 3% of public equities that are directly managed. Uh, we made the decision to conduct a scope one, two, and three carbon footprint analysis based on those holdings. We put the data in the hands of the students. We put the, the data in the hands of the faculty at Harvard, the Divest Harvard faculty group, and we called Harvard Management Company back. And so that's the report that I have in my hand. If any of you guys, excuse me, if any of you would have an interest in this report, uh, please uh, get in touch with me, give me your business card, and I'll send it over. Uh, thanks again to Tony and George for a great event. Perfect. Thank you. And last but far from least, Andy Bihar, make your way up to the stage. Uh, cue up his PowerPoint, please. He's, uh, we're waving the four-minute uh, hug thing for Andy. Oh, Steve, Andy's I got want a, a hug. Andy's got a very Hey, anybody who wants hugs, just see me after this. <laughs> um, CEO of As You Sow, uh, very exciting new tool, new resource to help make decisions about all the various opportunities that are available to you. Andy, take it away. Thank you very much. So what I'm about to, uh, to demonstrate for you is a new pl uh, web platform that we've developed at As You Sow, which is about transparency in the financial industry. Um, I have to give a call out, of course, to John Powers, because this all started when John came up to me after he had signed the divestment pledge personally, and he said, you know, Andy, this is great. I sold all of my equities in the Carbon Underground 200, but I still own coal-fired utilities. I still own Halliburton. I still own all these these companies, and I'm not even sure what I own in my mutual funds, what do you think? And so I was like, well, yeah, that should be pretty simple. So I started looking, and it ended up putting me, sending me down this, this rabbit hole where I started looking at the As You Sow um, 401k as well, and realized that I didn't really know what I owned, and that nobody really knows what they own embedded within their mutual funds. So after many, many spreadsheets, I had a guy put together a database for me, which then turned into a relationship with Morningstar so we could pull live data out of their API of the holdings of 1,500 mutual funds. We could compare it against the Carbon Underground 200 and various other lists, and I'm about to demonstrate it. This is just, by the way, not the live tool. This is still in beta form, but we are gonna be, after today, launching this with a few uh, fairly large 401ks so they can test their 401ks for carbon holdings. So what I'm gonna show you is, it's called Fossil Free Funds. It will be living under fossilfreefunds.org. It's got a password on it now, so, um, but soon we will be lifting that password. So let's say you come to Fossil Free Funds and you just say, well, what have I got in my, um, in my portfolio? Well, you can just put in a stock ticker. So let's just say, all right, I happen to own this S&P 500 stock. So you've now you've checked this box up at the top here for Carbon Underground 200, and what you see is that you're holding um, 10 point, oh, you see, this is what happens when you have a new tool, there's gotta be a, I'm gonna try that once more. Um, so what you see is this, looks like a pie chart. So 10.81% of the S&P 500 is 23 fossil fuels, fuel companies that are in the S&P 500. And here's the holding list. You see Exxon, Chevron, Conoco, and you can see Exxon's 4.23% Chevron's 2.27, and you can go like this and you can open it up and you can see that they're both in the carbon underground as well as in other sectors. So, well, what about the Filthy 15? That's a list that the original divestment campaign, it's, it's 10 coal utilities and five coal extraction companies. Well, if you click on that, well, now you're up to 33 and it's 16%. Coal is included in there. But now the oil and gas, oil, gas, and consumable fuels it's, it's what's called a business classification. There's 1,947 companies. That includes the 101st largest oil company and coal company, Halliburton, pipeline companies, all the companies build, doing the infrastructure around this. So if you click on that, you've now added up to 47, 
And then if you throw in some utilities, you're up to 21% in 67 fossil fuel company, and you can see exactly what they are. So there it is. It's just, it's really that simple. So now you say, all right, well, I probably, that's, uh, I've got, that's problematic for me. But what about, here's a, um, oh, here's a wind energy fund. That's got to be clean. And in fact, we had that in our As You Sows portfolio and thinking that it's clean, but it's actually 26.28% of it is in fossil fuels. And you can go back and again, you can, you can go and you can look at exactly what's in there, Duke, R Shell, all these other companies, and you can back it off. You can say, well, how many of these are, um, are carbon underground 200? Well, there's six of them, it's 8%. And you can, so again, this is, the idea is just, you can go in and you can look at your own 401k and you can decide what is um, a, what is fossil free and you can define it for yourself. So you're not, if, if carbon underground 200 is your definition, great. If you wanna look at utilities, great. If you wanna, however you wanna do it, you can self-define that. So let's just look at you know, some of the other ones. So you say, well, I want this green century balance fund. Well, that one, look at that, it's got five green ribbons. And <laughs> this was not a setup. I'm not taking any. Okay, so they got five green ribbons because it's just database matching. That's all we're doing. We're, we're going out to Morningstar. We're pulling in the holdings that are updated every month. We're comparing it. Carbon Underground 200 is updated every quarter. So there's new, it's, there, there's new ones because they're checking it by carbon intensity, by holdings intensity. And so you're either going to get a green ribbon or you're not. And um, so that, this is how this works. It's going to be available for free for anybody. You can go in and check your 401k. And what the plan is, is we're going to work with some fairly large foundations um, and fairly large green organizations um, in the next month to actually decarbonize their 401ks and 403bs. And then we're going to go out with a more public announcement saying, look, it, this worked for them. It took them a month to actually offer choices for people who have signed the divestment pledge, who work at these institutions that want something to buy in their 401k. And we're going to start then creating advocacy within companies because we believe that, for instance, a Google, an Apple, a uh, Exxon, there's probably people who signed the divestment pledge who are going to then, we're going to empower them to go to their 401k managers and say, we need change, or to organize within the companies. So we're gonna be creating like little agitation groups within the companies to say, we want to invest in the future. And so I'm gonna take a pause for some questions and then I may show you, if I have one more minute, I can show you another tool that we're developing that is actually about investing, that will actually allow you to look at all these clean techs, but I'm out of time, right? Okay, just real quick, this is the clean tech. Now, we, we published a paper about a year ago that looked at clean tech, and it's called Clean Tech Redefined, and we broke down the clean tech sector looking at clean energy efficiency, transportation, water. What we found is there was this conversation. Everybody kept saying, there's no deals, there's no companies to invest in, and it's, it's, all, it's all just solar or it's all Solyndra. And it's like, no, there's like hundreds of, of not only sectors, but subsectors is a theme across everything. And so, so we started doing this work and we decided rather than um, publishing another paper to actually make a sandbox for people to play in. And we call it Build Your Own Portfolio. And what it lets you do is, so you're in here and so you can go to this, um, you can go to a filter by sector. So for instance, if you go to, um, let's just say energy storage, I'm just gonna give a couple of just like quick examples. And I'm just going to pick, okay, here's, here's one, it's a, it's a fund, and I'm going to put, click hold, and it goes over there into your portfolio. And that's just a virtual portfolio just so you can play. And I'm going to go here to water, and I'm just going to pick, pick one here, and I'm going to pick another one here. Now, what just happened instantly is if you had bought those, you would have beaten the S&P, the NASDAQ, and the Dow Jones. Just like that. You can see those little check marks. But now we have this little waiting tool. So let's just say you said, you know what, I wish I had more small cap. Well, if you had been all in the small cap, you would have not beaten the 
It's that fast. You can actually go, and we're going to be scraping daily data from all these companies. We have about 112 companies in there now. We're going to be adding another hundreds of companies. The only rule to, to be on this, and we're going to put together an advisory board to help us pick the company, is when deployed, you reduce demand for fossil fuel and for water. But it's just, you'll be able to click on the company and get any background information. It's just, again, we just want transparency. We're, we're a 501c3, so all this stuff will be out there for free as a tool for managers, for people, for, for funds to play with. Sure. <laughs> so, big round of applause for all of our presenters this morning, please. No. Barbara is going to, I, I don't know, she's the boss now. I'm, I'm handing this over to, back to Barbara. Barbara's the boss. I just want to say, good morning. Um, I just want to say, you know, the, the divest decision is coupled very closely with the reinvest decision. The reinvest decision sometimes can be complex. But as Phil said, anybody who says it can't be done, anybody who says there's not enough, you know, choice out there is, you know, shouldn't be a consult the consultant to the client. Uh, what we tried to do this morning was, was present a few examples of tools and resources and, uh, and investment opportunities that can be utilized on the reinvestment side of the equation. So I hope we've succeeded. Thank you very much for your attention.